Welcome to this special edition of In the Lighthouse, your safe harbor from the storm. With your host, the Lighthouse Keeper, Daphne Collins bringing you Heroes of the Old Testament. Hello, and welcome to this special edition of In the Lighthouse, your safe harbor from the storm. This is Daphne Collins, your lighthouse keeper, welcoming you back to another installment of Heroes of the Old Testament. Today, I'm pleased to present part two in this series entitled The Patriarchs and Their Desperate Housewives and the continuation of our first featured patriarch, Abraham, and his wife, Sarah. In our first episode, we heard about how the nations dispersed over the face of the earth after the great flood. The descendants of Noah, particularly Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, was a major contributor in establishing great cities throughout the Fertile Crescent of ancient Mesopotamia. Controversy arose when the Lord God looked down on his creation and saw that instead of obeying his command to populate the earth, they chose instead to build a tower that would reach the heavens. These people desired to make a name for themselves and to thwart God's directive given to Noah's son and their generations. On that day, God confused the language of the people, and they, in turn, dispersed themselves and seized their building project. Our story then turned to a man who was from a pagan culture and worshipped the moon god, Nana. It was to this man, Abram, that the Lord God chose to call out from his family and his land. In case you've never heard this before, a covenant was a mutually accepted concept during ancient times and was typically an agreement made between a king and his subject. The suzerain, or king, in exchange for the subject's sworn loyalty, would promise all kinds of protection to his subject. The covenantal relationship between Yahweh, the suzerain, and Abraham, the vassal, was transactional. As Yahweh's vassal, he was expected to be faithful to the covenant promise. Three elements were included in this covenant. The promise to make Abraham into a great nation, to bless him and to make his name great, and to bless those who bless him. The promises of Yahweh were contingent on Abraham's obedience to his command. In Genesis 17 verses 1 through 12, the Lord God appeared before Abram to establish his covenant, which continues to this day. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you, 
the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male throughout your generations. God promised the newly named Abraham and his wife Sarai, whose name was changed to Sarah, a son, and told them that his name would be Isaac. Astonished, Abraham questioned God about his promise, knowing that he was 99 and Sarah 89. Initially, he thought the promise was for his son Ishmael, but God assured Abraham that Ishmael would be the ancestor of a great nation. However, Isaac would be the son of the covenant God was making with Abraham that day. Sarah, his barren wife, would bear a son from her own body. And speaking of the body, The signature made between God and Abraham was for a physical circumcision of the foreskin on all males in his household, eight days and older, as an outward sign of the covenant promise. This covenant of the flesh was intended as an everlasting one that is carried from generation to generation. Abraham immediately went into action, and he, his son Ishmael, and all the men of his household, slave and free, were circumcised of the flesh on that same day. He did not hesitate in fulfilling his part of the agreement. God would soon fulfill his purpose through him. Okay, let's get started. Abraham and Sarah were childless because she was barren. Moreover, they were advanced in age, and Sarah was decades into her menopause. Due to an act of desperation made by Sarah years earlier, Abraham had a teenage son named Ishmael, born by the surrogacy of her Egyptian servant, Hagar. Although Abraham accepted the mistake that resulted in Ishmael's birth, he was hopeful still because of what God told him. He believed in God's promise of a son from Sarah, and he obeyed God's directive to circumcise all the males of his household. Abraham awaited God's continued guidance while he and his household recovered from their circumcisions as agreed upon in the covenant. Little did he know that God would arrive in person to deliver some very good news to Abraham. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, 
while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three sayas of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Hospitality is a friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests visitors, or strangers. It is a virtue on display throughout all of Scripture. Leviticus 19 verses 33 and 34 encourages, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. I am the Lord your God. As the patriarch of a large household, Abraham did not hesitate to personally extend hospitality to the three unusual guests who suddenly appeared before him as he sat at the entrance of his tent. He invited them to sit beneath the shade of the trees at Mamre, and he and his wife Sarah personally saw to the comfort of these honored guests. The care Abraham took to welcome these visitors, from the washing of their feet, to serving cakes made by Sarah's hands, and serving them the roasted flesh of a young calf, was his personal showing of hospitality and the acknowledgement of their importance and sudden visit. It's possible that he knew the identity of the speaker because his voice was familiar to Abraham. He was more than convinced that this was God Almighty appearing in the flesh, the same God who spoke with him on the previous occasions. This appearance in the flesh, according to Bible scholars, was a theophany of the Most High God. The two other visitors were messenger angels, their identity is not given, who would soon play an important role in explaining their purpose for appearing in the vicinity of Abraham and Sarah. Refreshed from the hospitality extended to them by the elder couple, the three visitors prepared to leave but hesitated and the leader whom Abraham identified as God in the flesh stood before him and declared, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Both Abraham and Sarah, who was behind the tent door, were of course pleased to finally hear the good news. He, because once again, the Lord repeated what would be and when it would happen. Sarah, smiling, made a snorting sound behind her hand as she considered the absurdity of what she'd heard. When the Lord admonished Sarah for scoffing at his declaration, she tried, unsuccessfully, to deny it. How would you react if you were told something seemingly impossible? Would you immediately accept it at face value and reply, Thank you, I believe you. Or would you scoff as Sarah did? God will allow some of us to be tested for our faith when news of things we perceive as impossible is presented. Faith is something that we can pretend. When the testing comes, and it will, true faith will reveal the sincerity of our hearts.
The arrival of the three visitors was twofold. It was presented as a test of hospitality towards a stranger and for a message to be delivered. It was for Abraham and Sarah to show hospitality and for them to receive good news about the long-awaited promise of a child. Furthermore, two of the three visitors came to render God's judgment against the wicked cities located on the east side of the Jordan Valley, primarily Sodom and Gomorrah. The two men who remained silent during their time with Abraham and Sarah nodded their thanks, left the Lord's side, and departed purposefully in the direction of Sodom. The Lord God rose to leave as well, and while he walked in the same direction as the two men, he considered Abraham, who walked alongside him for part of the way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Abraham's covenantal purpose was underway and in accordance with God's word. The promise of nations born of his body was another seemingly impossible obstacle already orchestrated by God by a simple declaration. Then, before he could celebrate the news with Sarah, God presented Abraham with his intent to destroy the wicked cities of the Jordan Valley. One of those cities contained Lot and his family. Imagine what Abraham must have felt upon hearing this news of the mass destruction. Abraham's mind was racing with visions of people running and screaming. He imagined great conflagrations before his very eyes. Did he have the right to beg the Lord to rescind his plan? What possible argument could he give to try and stay in the hand of God? Then an idea came to mind, and Abraham humbled himself and interceded on behalf of any righteous people still living within the boundaries of the cities. He beseeched God's mercy on those who chose to remain righteous before the Lord and to spare them from the coming destruction. God listened to Abraham's plea and acceded to his willingness to spare the cities if at least Ten righteous people could be found within their boundaries. The Genesis narrative continued when the two visitors arrived in Sodom, were met by Lot, who was sitting at the city gate. Witnessing that they were sojourners never before seen in the Jordan Valley, he greeted them and offered the hospitality of his home, knowing that their arrival would spark curiosity and a brutal display of depravity would soon follow from the male residents living within the city walls. They graciously accepted Lot's hospitality and the protection of his house. But before they lay down, the men of Sodom surrounded the house and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. 
Lot went out to the men and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Let's take a moment for this short break. When we return, we will continue with part two of The Patriarchs and Their Desperate Housewives and our first featured couple, Abraham and Sarah. This is Eternal Treasures with Melissa Sines. How has God turned an evil committed against you into good in your life? This week's devotion for reflection and prayer is entitled A Greater Purpose and is inspired by Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The Old Testament story of Joseph, the son of the great patriarch Jacob, found in Genesis 37 through 50, details the harrowing difficulties he experienced following the betrayal that his brothers committed against him out of jealousy of his father's favoritism toward their younger brother. Joseph's brothers plotted against him and sold him into slavery and lied to their father about the death of his son to cover up their sin against God, Jacob, and their brother. Joseph was estranged from his family for many years and endured much adversity. Not only was he betrayed by his brothers, but he was later falsely accused of sexual assault by Potiphar's wife and unjustly imprisoned. Despite all that he went through, God extended mercy, provision, and favor to Joseph in every circumstance. Joseph sought God in the midst of every situation he experienced. He spent decades away from his family yet found himself in a position of power as second in command of Pharaoh in Egypt. God was preparing Joseph for a greater purpose through the trials of his earlier years. The Genesis narrative explains that there were bad harvests and ultimately famine in the land. By God's instruction, Joseph began making provisions for the upcoming years when food would be scarce. Furthermore, God intended that Jacob's sons would come to Joseph and ask for his help as well as restore him back to his family. Instead of scorn, Joseph extended mercy, compassion, and forgiveness and provided for his entire family. Joseph's story is an outstanding example of how God will allow difficult life events to strengthen us in order to produce extraordinary outcomes. God is always orchestrating the details in the background. Although we don't always understand his plan at the moment, it's imperative that we trust him through the process. Joseph trusted God through all his trials, and God used Joseph to save many people. God wove all the events of Joseph's life for his divine purpose. Sometimes our disappointments just may be divine appointments. It's possible that God may be allowing unpleasant events in your life to produce in you a purposeful result. The conclusion of this inspiring story reveals that when we are faithful, God is faithful to redeem and restore us. How can Joseph's story encourage you as you walk through adversity? Let us pray. Father God, I thank you that although others may plot evil against me, you will use it for your good purpose. Help me to be steadfast and confident that you are with me. I pray for a heart filled with love, compassion, and forgiveness as I experience various trials. May I be an encouragement to others experiencing similar circumstances. 
I trust in your sovereignty and believe that whatever you allow in my life, it is intended ultimately for your glory. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any suggestions or comments, please email me at thelady at carrythelightministries.com. You have been listening to Eternal Treasures with Melissa Signs. Welcome back. We will continue to the conclusion of part two of The Patriarchs and Their Desperate Housewives and our first featured couple, Abraham and Sarah. The two visitors were sent by God to rescue Lot and his family from God's pending wrath over the cities of the plain. God promised to spare the cities if at least ten righteous people could be found living within their walls. The two visitors were sent to warn Lot to take his family and leave immediately because the Lord was about to destroy the city. Listener, recall that Lot, in his haste to show hospitality, wanted to spare the two men who were under his protection from harm. He chose instead to offer his two virgin daughters to the mob of men pounding at his door. Those depraved men had no interest in knowing Lot's daughters. They wanted to engage in carnal relations with the two male visitors, angelic beings who were sent to destroy them. But the Lord God kept the two innocent women under His protection through the presence of these angels in their midst. As dawn approached, They urged Lot to make haste and escape to Zoar and warned that none of them should look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham. The narrative detailed the complete destruction of four of the five cities of the plain of Jordan, Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as Adma and Zeboim. The city of Zoar, was spared because it was there that Lot and his daughters escaped. He and his daughters did not remain in Zoar, but escaped to live in the hills because he was afraid for their safety or reprisal from the people living there. Abraham's intercession for the people from the cities of the plain was successful in saving the lives of his nephew Lot and his two daughters. Out of all the cities, only three survived God's wrath. The Lord relented for the sake of Lot and his immediate family. Even when Lot dithered in his decision to leave, he had no sense of urgency to act. This is the way of salvation for us all. We can't save ourselves. Only God can do this. Like Lot, we procrastinate in our decisions, unwilling to surrender fully to Christ. 
The choice we're given is to flee from our sin and its ultimate destruction. God used natural elements like bitumen and brimstone to carry out his divine justice. The raining down of this combustible matter caused a conflagration so broad that no one was able to escape it. Abraham and Lot were tested for their ability to show hospitality to the stranger or the sojourner in their midst. Lot and his daughters barely escaped the judgment against blatant depravity in the presence of a holy and righteous God who tests the sincerity of our faith. He demonstrated to the people of the Jordan Valley that his justice was swift and righteous. Abraham and Sarah sojourned in Gerar, a Philistine territory in the western Negev on the way to Egypt. Abimelech, the king of Gerar, desired Sarah for his wife, believing that she was Abraham's sister. Once again, the details of their relationship were withheld by Abraham concerning Sarah. Once again, God intervened by communicating to Abimelech in a dream the consequences that would follow if he took Sarah as his wife. Abimelech listened to God's warning and the next day returned Sarah to Abraham and allowed them to dwell in Karar and paid him a thousand pieces of silver for holding her back from her husband. Furthermore, as it was with the Pharaoh in Egypt, the king of Gerar gave Abraham sheep and oxen, as well as male and female servants. Because of this blessing, Abraham prayed to God on behalf of Abimelech and his household. God answered his prayers and healed the king's wife and female slaves whose wounds were closed because he was holding Sarah in his harem. They remained in Gerar at the king's invitation and bounty. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that the child was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named, and I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. In the fullness of time, God opened Sarah's womb, and she conceived and gave birth to a son whose name was Isaac. Sarah was 90 years old when Isaac was born. God demonstrated his power over the impossible and brought laughter to Sarah. In accordance with his covenant with God, Abraham circumcised his son eight days following his birth. If left unattended, 
bitter weeds of jealousy and resentment will spread rapidly and wreck the harmony of the home. When Isaac was weaned from his mother's breast, Abraham hosted a feast in celebration. Sarah observed Ishmael teasing his half-brother and felt the old insecurities concerning the first son born to Abraham because Hagar conceived immediately. She recalled the times Abraham spent with his eldest son and resented his presence in her home. Wanting to ensure that her son did not share his inheritance with Ishmael, the son of a slave, Hagar, Sarah insisted that Abraham exile Hagar and Ishmael from their community. God instructed Abraham to do as Sarah asked. God assured the patriarch that he would watch over Hagar and Ishmael, who would also find a nation because he was Abraham's son. The Bible says that God was with Ishmael as he grew up in the eastern Sinai Peninsula. He married an Egyptian woman found for him by his mother and settled in the desert of Paran. He had 12 sons who became great rulers and eventually a nation of people known as Arabs who later settled in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide, as it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The time for testing of Abraham's complete faith in the Lord God was presented to the patriarch in the form of his willingness to sacrifice his promised son, Isaac. When Abraham heard the Lord's instruction to take his son and offer him up as a burnt offering to the Lord, he did not question or pretend he didn't hear him. Abraham obeyed and immediately did as he was instructed. Have you ever received what you strongly believe to be instructions from the Lord? Did you obey or pretend you didn't hear them? 
Tests come to us in many forms and at unexpected times. When we undergo periods of divine testing, do we choose to run and hide or purposely disobey to avoid difficulty? Tests are sent to expose the sincerity of our faith. They strengthen our resolve and make us grow in knowledge and love of God's almighty power. God provided this sacrifice in place of Isaac for Abraham because the patriarch placed his absolute trust in God's providential care. He didn't know what was ahead, but he knew that God would provide the sacrifice because he never lied to Abraham. Everything he told him he would do when Abraham first heard his voice, God fulfilled. Much of the promises God made were for future things, but the many blessings he and Sarah received were plenty. God provided the sacrifice in place of Isaac to foreshadow God's sacrifice of his only son, Jesus, as the atonement for our sins. Following this event, Abraham moved his family to Beersheba and lived there. The place where Abraham bought his teenage son, Isaac, was Mount Moriah, the sacred site where King Solomon built the glorious temple. The place that Abraham named Yahweh Yare, which means the Lord will provide. Its historical significance also refers to a hill called Calvary, where God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. So, when a divine test is presented to you, remember that your faith will save you as it did countless others who chose to trust God in the midst of their storms. He will never leave you alone. He will always see you through it and ultimately strengthen your faith. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as a property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites. My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. 
After this, Abraham buried his wife, Sarah, in the cave of the fields of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is, Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The fields and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Sarah, the half-sister who became the wife of Abraham, the patriarch, sojourned from Ur of the Chaldeans and died at the age of 127 in Canaan, the territory of the Hittites. In honor of his wife and to find a permanent place of burial, Abraham purchased a plot of land from Ephron the Hittite. It was in Hebron, in the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham laid the remains of his beloved wife, Sarah. Sarah, his sometimes desperate housewife, was the strength behind the patriarch. Abraham acknowledged the value she brought to him because of her beauty and her wisdom when he needed her support for all he set out to do, even when it seemed impossible. Youthful in appearance, Sarah's beauty was also Abraham's fear. Rulers wanted her, but only God could help them get away unscathed from injury. And both times, with near misses, they left with more than they came with. Abraham's choice of the location of their final burying place was to honor Sarah for all the moments of desperation during their years of sojourning. Sarah is the first of the wives of the patriarchs buried in the cave alongside her husband. The patriarch left behind eight sons. Sarah, his half-sister and daughter of Terah, was his lawful wife. Hagar, the mother of his eldest son Ishmael, was Sarah's servant turned concubine to Abraham and surrogate for Sarah. Then, after Sarah's death, Abraham's concubine Keturah was elevated and bore him six sons, Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Sarah, however, being Abraham's only wife, possessed the legal right and social standing as Abraham's true wife. Their only child, Isaac, became the rightful heir to the family name and inheritance. Before his death, Abraham gave all his material possessions and the blessings of the covenant to Isaac, the child promised by God to Abraham and Sarah. To the sons of Hagar and Keturah, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living. He sent the sons of Keturah to the east and away from their half-brother Isaac and his inheritance so that conflict would not arise following Abraham's death. The scriptures tell us that at the age of 175 years, Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years. Isaac and Ishmael and their six brothers buried their father Abraham in the cave of Machpelah, in the fields of Ephron the son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre. There, Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lahai Roy, the well of the living one who sees me, located between Kadesh and Bered, on the way to Shur. This is the place where God appeared to Hagar near a spring in the desert.
Thank you so much for joining me for our special episode of the Heroes of the Old Testament and this In the Lighthouse podcast. I hope you enjoyed this second part of the two-part series which featured our first patriarch, Abraham, and his wife, Sarah, in The Patriarchs and Their Desperate Housewives. But stay tuned. We will return in two weeks with the next patriarch, Isaac, and his lovely wife, Rebecca. I invite you to click on that bell to receive a notice of when it's uploaded. Many of us choose to enter the dating arena by finding that special someone online by looking at a few pictures and reading their profile. What happens if your spouse is chosen for you, sight unseen, by a faithful servant? Find out what happens when the dashing young patriarch, Isaac, laden with servants, livestock, and land, not to mention blessings from God Almighty, comes up empty for available ladies for marriage. What's a patriarch to do? So, he sends his servant, Eliezer, to look far and wide to find him a wife. The drama continues. Transcripts for this and all future episodes can be found in our show notes. We welcome you to visit us at The Lighthouse on the web at www carrythelightministries.com and of course you can follow us on social media I'm your lighthouse keeper Daphne Collins with Carry the Light Ministries bringing you this special edition until next time be blessed